Welcome to the 21st Annual K. Malmstrom <coughs> Lecture in Physics at Hamlin University. Welcome on this beautiful fall day. We're just delighted to have each and every one of you here with us. Um, before I uh, make remarks about the Malmstrom Lecture and uh, the donor who made that possible, I have an introduction I'd like to make to all of you who come on an annual basis. Uh, to these lectures here at Hamlin. I would like to ask our new provost, Eric Jensen, if he would stand. He's up here to my right, so that you can all know who is uh, now our chief academic uh, officer here at Hamlin University. And uh, he is in charge of all things that have to do with academics and students here. And so I delegate a lot to him. Uh, so please welcome uh, Provost Jensen. Custom, I would also allow, uh, like to ask all of uh, the colleagues and the students who uh, have and enjoy wonderful relationships and benefits from our uh, faculty in the Department of Physics. Would the faculty and staff from the department please stand and allow us to thank you for your work for Hammond? Please stand. relationships with the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, and I believe most of you know him by case now, Dean John Matashek. John, would you please stand? I want to just take a moment today to acknowledge and to honor the memory of the man who 21 years ago uh, created this lecture in memory of his wife. Carl Malmstrom passed away in 2010 at the age of 97. And those of you who've come to these lectures over the years, you may recall, many times Carl would be seated right here in the, in the front row along with some of his family members. Uh, Carl was a physics and mathematics major in Hamlin's class of 1936. He received his master's in physics from Syracuse University in 1938, and then he earned his U.S. Navy wings at Pensacola in 1940, and he became a decorated World War II naval aviator who served in North Africa and the Pacific, including multiple missions over Iwo Jima. And then returning to his physics career after the war, Carl helped form the Atomic Energy Department. Carl designed and constructed the first nuclear reactor to power an orbiting NASA satellite. In his later years, Carl enthusiastically supported physics here at Hamlin. He continued to travel the world, and he even piloted small aircraft into his 80s. He was awarded an honorary doctor of science from Hamlin in 1991. And so Carl endowed this lecture with funds uh, to the university as a way of not only honoring his wife, and her name was Emma K. Malmstrom, and honoring their life together, but also as a way to give to the Hamlin community members access to some of the best scientific minds of the world. We have welcomed many great scientists, professors, uh, over these, uh, as well as, as practicing scientists in all sorts of, of organizations, corporations, entities around the world, over these 21 years. And we have given students and professors and the public uh, from some of our public schools, and if we have uh, uh, some teachers from some of our uh, schools in the area, we also welcome you today but have an opportunity for us all to come together and to talk with these very, very reputable, noted, extremely um, uh, well-credentialed um, scientists, and Carl made all of that possible. Carl personally attended the first 19 annual lectures before his passing, asking those great minds difficult questions. And I was just uh, speaking of, uh, just a while ago with our special guest today, and I said, you know, you may, have, uh, you may have missed Carl, because Carl really enjoyed uh, having some time with our lecturers, and 
at 95, which would have been the last time he was here, he was still pummeling the lecturer with all kinds of questions. And uh, that was always a very enjoyable uh, opportunity for our special scientist guest. And so even uh, as we uh, begin this activity today, even though Carl is not with us, I, do would like, I would like to ask us all to applaud in his memory and in honor of this day. This lecture is just one example. What distinguishes our programs is the ability to work closely with professors who are dedicated to helping students to develop your interests and your skills. And today at a luncheon, just prior to this um, opportunity to be together, we were able to be with some of the moms from Scholars. And it was, it's wonderful to hear their stories of collaborative research with professors and where they are in their educational journey. Our professors here at Hamlin are highly regarded experts in their field, and at Hamlin you have this opportunity to work among the very, very best. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you the chair of Hamlin's physics department, Professor Bruce Bolin. Bruce, who arrived at Hamlin in 2002, received his PhD in physics from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and he teaches a large variety of courses at Hamlin, including the physics of sound, engineering statics and dynamics, modern physics, and more. A bit of a renaissance man, Bruce enjoys many activities outside of Hamlin, including playing racquetball, living and breathing, baseball, and composing and performing music. Please join me in welcoming the chair of the physics department, Professor Bruce Bowen. Thank you, welcome everyone. Um, I wanted to say a few brief words about Wolfgang Ketterle. Uh, I know there's a lot in the, in the handout that you have, but I wanted to hit a few highlights. Wolfgang has been the John D. MacArthur Professor of Physics at MIT since 1998, where he leads a research group exploring the properties of ultra-cold gases. He receives a PhD in physics from the University of Munich in 1986 and did postdoctoral work at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics and at the University of Heidelberg in molecular spectroscopy and combustion diagnostics. And then in 1990, went to MIT as a postdoc and joined the faculty there in 1993. Um, now in terms of his Nobel Prize, which was amazingly awarded based on work that, if you listen to what I had just said, he, he uh, joined the faculty there in 1993. It was in 1995 he did the work that led to the Nobel Prize. So his observation of Bose-Einstein condensation in a gas in, in that year of 1995 and the first realization of an atom laser in 1997 were recognized with the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001 together with Eric Cornell, who happened to be our 2004 Malmstrom speaker, and Carl Wyman. Now, the way physics research works, sometimes you see something in experimental physics that you don't understand and then try to apply theory to it. Sometimes it's the other way around. You have something that's theoretically proposed and don't see it in the experiment for a while. Now this is one of the cases of the latter where this was actually based on work that, that Bose and, and Indian physicists had, had uh, theoretically worked through in 1924 and had difficulty getting it all um, accepted, published, and so he sent his work to um, Albert Einstein and that then he had, Albert Einstein had had the work, you know, went through it, made sure he agreed with it, went, had the work published and under Bose's name, and so that was the, the earliest uh, development of Bose-Einstein condensation, but that was 1924. It was 70 years or so before this was actually seen in the laboratory, jointly almost at the same time between the group I'd mentioned that were the, the co-recipients of the Nobel Prize and our, our invited speaker today, Wolfgang Ketterle. So he's here to, to talk about that, among other things, and he uh, has a wealth of information, so definitely ask questions at the end, as I'm sure he'll be very glad to, to answer them. So thank you very much for being here, Wolfgang, and I look forward to hearing you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and 
I should say, no matter how, how busy I am with research and teaching, I love to give a few public lectures every year because it's important to me. Important for a number of reasons. One is I want to teach or I want to lecture beyond just the physics community to show people that science and in particular physics is still very, very exciting. Today I want to give you an example of a discovery in physics which took place 15 years ago, rather recently, and it has changed the textbooks of physics. So even an area like physics, which has a century-long tradition, has many opportunities uh, for new discoveries, and I would actually say physics right now is as exciting as it has been 100 years ago when the big discoveries were made, which we teach in high school, well, we are making now the discoveries which will be taught in high school, hopefully later. On the other hand, physics has also gotten uh, very strong competitors in the life sciences and computer sciences, so to the young students here, you really have the choice between exciting disciplines, but physics is as exciting and as active as it has ever been. Secondly, when I give a public lecture, I also want to address that to know something about science, to know something about physics, is also of cultural value. So many people think it's just, you know, reading books, going to the theater, uh, or listening to a piece of music. I'm really happy that you are here and I can play a piece of physics for you. <laughs> and the piece of physics I want to play is the amazing world which opens up when you go to very, very low temperatures. And I will tell you that those temperatures are much, much lower than what you can imagine from your earthly environment. But let me start out by not just showing you the wondrous world of low temperature, let me motivate the research. Our research is motivated by the quest for new materials. And you know there are new discoveries in electronic materials and magnetic materials, and they are responsible for the iPhone, for the iPad, and for many important developments. And the materials which are the focus of my talk today are the super materials, materials which have the word super in their name, super fluidity and super conductivity, and that's why it should be interesting. <laughs> Just to explain it very simply, what is super fluidity? Super fluidity means that particles can move without friction, without viscosity, without dissipation. And that is something which is unusual. You know, when you stir water in a pot and you take the spoon out, the water stops rotating. If the water were superfluid, it would go on and go on and go on for days and weeks and years. This is superfluidity. And because you've never observed it in the kitchen or in your everyday life, there must be something special to it. And the special thing is, you really need low temperature and you need quantum physics. But let me show you an example for super behavior. This is really creepy. It's a container, sort of an inch wide, with liquid helium, and it's superfluid helium. And what you see is the superfluid helium drips out of the container because it creeps up the walls. Imagine you have a cup of coffee, and the coffee would drip out, not because your cup is leaking, because the coffee creeps up the walls. Of course, to drip out is not violating energy conservation, it's driven by gravity. But a normal liquid cannot do it because if you want, there is always a very, very thin film absorbed on the surface. But if water wants to flow in a thin film, there would just be too much viscosity and it doesn't do it on any practical scale. But a superfluid can flow without viscosity and appear to us in this creepy way. Now, there is a form of super behavior, super fluidity, which um, is important for technical applications, and this is when the superfluid particles, which move without friction, are charged. Then we're talking about superconductivity. And let me show you superconductivity in action. Uh, this is uh, a superconducting disk, and what is levitating on top of it is a small magnet. Try to do that at home with a box of magnets from your little brother or from your children. You will never be able to do that. You always know when you have a magnet and drop it, click, the magnets will not levitate, they will just stick together. Because what happens here is, is not the ordinary magnetic forces, it's superconductivity in action. What happens is, if a magnet falls 
over metal surface, it induces currents, the so-called eddy currents, and the magnet will slow down. But since the eddy currents decay away because of dissipation in normal metal, eventually the, the, the magnet will hit the ground, will hit the metal, and that's it. But in a superconductor, you create eddy currents, and the eddy currents flow around and around forever. And this is responsible for this magnetic resolution. Of course, there are applications for superconductors. This here just shows an example between a superconducting cable, and this cable can carry as much current as all these many copper cables combined. Simply because a superconducting cable does not heat up, whereas copper cables are limited in their capability by the heating of the copper due to normal conduction. Maybe the closest encounter you may find with uh, superconductors is if you go to hospital. All major hospitals have MRI scanning facilities. In those hospitals, if you have very powerful magnets, and they are superconducting. That means you charge up the magnets with a power supply, then you can take the power supply away, and the current just keeps on circulating for days, for months, for years. Now, why don't superconductors have, if they are so they have super properties, why, why don't we find them everywhere? Why don't we find them in our household, in electronic gadgets, in our automobiles? Well, the reason is that this phenomenon only occurs at low temperature. This is the Kelvin scale, so this is here about minus 400 degree Fahrenheit. And uh, there was enormous excitement immediately recognized with the Nobel Prize when people found superconductors, which are superconducting at a much higher temperature but much higher is still very cold. So what is still missing is the room temperature superconductor. And I can guarantee to the young people in this audience, if you do research and you discover the room temperature superconductor, you will have a big impact on science, technology, and even society. However, until today, we do not know if we will ever find a room temperature superconductor. And the approach, of course, of researchers is, well, if there is, no, if there is no finding which rules it out, we have to try and we have to figure out what, what, are, the, what are the rules behind superconducting behavior and figure out ways to find better superconductors. Uh, before I continue, let me just point out that this weird effect of superconductivity, that there is motion without friction, is truly a quantum effect, and quantum mechanics means that the nature of particles is not just that they behave like particles, they also behave like waves. So let me just illustrate that you have electrons going down in a wire, but every wire has imperfections, dislocations, impurities, vacancies, and such. So even if you have a small amount of those dislocations, uh, the moving electron would just bounce off, and bouncing off means friction, dissipation, Ohm's law, and heating. However, now imagine that all the electrons together just form one big wave. Then this wave can just move around the impurities. It's a little bit like if you go to the shore and you put a stick into the ground, and then the waves just bend around the stick and continue unobstructed. So the physics of waves makes it possible to have superconducting behavior, motion without friction. But now the question is, how can we make all particles, all electrons, behave like one big wave? So, so I was, as a motivation or as a big goal of the field of solid state physics, uh, I was putting out the quest for better superconductors. And now you can approach in the following way. You can say, well, maybe we can just take the structure of a superconductor, and this is a unit cell of one of the most advanced superconductors. The, the only impression I want to give you, it's very complicated. It has barium, terbium, copper, and oxide atoms. But the message I want to give you, if you take this structure and put it on the most powerful computers of the world, by a big margin, the computation power is not enough to predict accurately the superconducting behavior. Modern materials can be so complicated that even with the most advanced 
computational <coughs> methods, you cannot calculate the superconducting properties. So that means we have to do experimental research. Now, there are material designer people who, me, 